I to this not no you not so I'm getting you not I A by two by uh a, a square by four plus x square under root a square by two plus x squares. So I think this seems to be the right answer. Okay. Just let me confirm. Uh, is it uh, I A or I A square? Oh, um, I take it. I even I'm not sure. This is. Um, okay. <coughs> Sir, it's I A square. Is it I A square? Yes, sir. Well, dimensionally, the denominator is A cube, right? Yes, sir. If X is much bigger, it will be X cube. Uh, yeah, this should be I. And is it for two, 2 pi or 4 pi? I, I'm not sir, sure. I'm getting 2 pi. 2 pi. Okay. All right. No, I just check. <coughs> okay. All right. <coughs> so let's assume this is the answer. I think this part is because this part is uh, clear to me. This is correct. <coughs> and uh, I hope you must have taken the 4B cos or sin theta, right? Yes, sir. Hmm, then that's correct. Actually. Yeah, that should be correct. Okay. <coughs> so let's say if you would like to do it for the, the axis of a polygon, we can also do the same way, right? Yes, sir. So if we just believe that this is some polygon, the remaining part I'm not doing. And if this is the axis of the polygon, So at this point, we can find the B value. So we can join the center of this wire to this point, correct? And at this point, it will be the current is I. So the B will be like this. You can say B1, this is theta. So, <coughs> okay. And this will form another, another separate uh, triangle. So this is, uh, again, We have to find this length also, so we can find that length. Uh, this is called d as of now. This is x square plus d square, and uh, n pi by n will be a by two d, right? So d is always a by two cot pi by n. Correct. And uh, this is a separate diagram this is a and the point that we have uh, drawn forms another big triangle right yes,
and now we have to find this alpha angle, right? And this we know this is x square plus b square, uh, which you can leave like this, or you can call it r as of now. So <coughs> Sin alpha will be how much? A by two and A by two upon this right R dash. And the R dash is how much? A square by four plus A square plus D is correct. Again, Pythagoras. <coughs> And uh, this will be too much now. So the final answer will be B1 is how much? So this is due to one single wire, it is mu naught by 4 pi <coughs> i by r, which is like a d into 2 sin alpha, right? So this is too much. What to do? And then the net answer will be BP equals to N times B1 sine theta. That's too much. Oh my God. Okay, so if you want, you can do this. You can generalize this for the N sided regular polygon. The same thing, but it won't be easy. Understood this part? How we are doing? Yes, yes sir. <laughs> okay, so next we can do is uh, the full due to this is done, the spiral is done. So now we have to understand something called <coughs> magnetic field due to current carrying circular loop. at its axial position So let's say if we have a current carrying loop, and now we define something called number of turns. So let's say let capital N be the total number of overlapping turns. Okay. So we have not only one turn, because generally what happens like we are trying to create a coil. So in case of coil, what happens like we keep on wrapping the same wire again and again. So right now we are believing that the wires are overlapping, which means all will have same radius. So although it looks like one ring, but it is now n rings kept at the same place. And the wires are really thin. So this approximation is quite good, right? Hello, hello. Yes, now I can hear you. So let's say this is carrying current I. Now I is a current through each turn, not through the ring. What is I? Current through 
each turn okay so we are supposed to find the magnetic field at the point p now all the previous formula which we have derived uh, will not be applicable because the point is not in the plane the point is away from the plane of the loop and therefore you have to rederive from the bayard shift so you can try or think for a while and then i'll give the solution okay <coughs> so try this out.
some yeah so i'm getting mu not i r square by 2 r square plus x square to the power 3 by 2 excellent the right answer just you have to do one thing The only thing you have to just multiply with n. Oh, yes. Because we have n number of terms. Where oh. So you derive from basic, no? Yes. Sir, are you speaking something? No, no, just. So the BP turns out to be mu naught n i r square upon twice of x square plus r square power three times. <coughs> so the I think the process is same. You can take a DL element and yes. it will create a matrix at this point at the right angle to this line. And this is called DB, and then we can take the X component and integrate, right? So I hope this is what you did. Yes, sir. Right. Now this formula is very, very important to us because many other formula can be derived from this idea. Okay. <clears throat> so now we can define something very interesting and very, very important also. That's called the Magnetic dipole moment of current carrying you <coughs> magnetic dipole moment of current carrying you. So every current carrying loop of let's say n turns, which are overlapping turns, every current carrying loop is act as a tiny magnetic dipole. And depending on the current circulation, <coughs> it will behave as a tiny magnet. And just like the tiny magnet will have a dipole moment, the loop will also have a dipole. Moment. And why it is so? Because a tiny magnet will create the lines of force So the lines of force that uh, uh, current carrying loop will create will resemble the field lines that is developed due to the, the bar magnet. So both will have the similarity in terms of the field that they create. And therefore, it is a good assumption to behave or treat every loop as a dipole. <coughs> so generally, the idea of dipole is uh, interesting because that will simplify the way of writing various formula in magnetism which will resemble the formula that we have already written in electrostatics. So the magnetic dipole moment 
of a loop with an address <coughs> number of turns current and the area that the loop in captures so you can see this loop if having the radius r will in capture an area of pi r square right so yes. that area if you multiply the product of these three terms is called dipole moment of the loop in vector notation, we write as n i a vector, and the area vector we take in the sense of current flow. For example, in this case, you can see the current is uh, n t clockwise. If you look from the top, correct? Yes. Sir. So for this observation, it is n t clockwise. <laughs> so if you use the right hand thumb rule, and if you put your curls of finger along the periphery the thumb will be the direction of area vector which is upward or downward which is, so this will behave as a dipole in which the dipole moment is acting upward <coughs> okay so the nia is a nice way to convert this into And the direction of area vector we decide with the help of the current flow in the loop. So once we are sure about how the current is flowing, we can decide the area vector and hence we can decide the direction of dipole moment. Okay. Now we'll come back to the same formula that we just derived, the elect uh, the magnetic field due to the current carrying loop on its axis. So we have already derived the formula. So at the point P, <coughs> if you look at the curl of the finger, the dipole moment vector is like this, correct? Yes. And also, if you look at the magnetic field direction at the point P, it is in the same direction. Yes. So we can see that <coughs> since the point P lies on the axis of the dipole, therefore the magnetic field will be in the direction of dipole moment vector, correct? Yes, sir. So BP, which is the magnetic field on the point on the axis, and the dipole moment will have the same direction. If you reverse the current, the field will also reverse. <laughs> okay. Yes. So therefore, <coughs> uh, The BP formula which you wrote earlier, which is mu naught by two in I R square upon X square plus R square power three by two. This we can rewrite as mu naught by four pi. Not because I have to make it four pi, I have to write here two pi because actually it was only mu naught by two. <coughs> and then I can write as uh, R square N I, which I'm rearranging the terms <coughs> upon X square plus and now you can see the BP you can write as mu naught by 4 pi twice of I into pi R square which is you can write N like this What is I into pi r square? It is the area. Yes. So the dipole moment here is n into I into pi r square. 
So this entire term you can substitute as three by two, right? Yes, sir. So the matrix we can rewrite in this format, and this is like a usual K of the magnetism, right? Yes, sir. And uh, <clears throat> if I go one step further, and that is called the dipole approximation. So we know that for dipole approximation, So for dipole approximation, we know the PM equals to, uh, sorry, for dipole approximation, we know the X is equals to much bigger than the, the dimension of the loop. Yes, sir. And therefore, <coughs> X square plus R square is as good as X square. So the BP turns out to be V naught by four pi, 2 pm upon x squared. <laughs> Isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah, so I think your answer is correct. What you got the first question, I'll tell you why. <coughs> so BP is this answer. Yes, sir. And this is similar to the electrostatics. If I introduce a new constant called uh, KM, the magnetic K, let's call K. So it is very much similar to the dipole, uh, the electric field formula at the axis of dipole, right? Yes, sir. Now this similarity is uh, really powerful because in examination, if you even, if you remember the similarity, you can easily re recall the formula. Yes, sir. Because both are dipole and both will have the similar expression. And having said that X is much bigger than the dimension will make things even easier because it will exactly match the formula of electrostatics. Correct? Yes, sir. So this particular way of defining the dipole moment, having the consequence that it uh, converts the most formula of the electrostatics, sorry, the magnetism into electrostatic equivalent. Yes, sir. Understood? Okay. Yes, sir. So <clears throat> now the benefit is like if you remember the question which you solved as a homework. So if I say that if uh, X is much bigger than A, then it will exactly fit the dipole formula. And uh, the dipole moment vector, the magnetic dipole moment of this will be very much simple to N I A square, right? Yes, sir. And the BP you can write as mu naught by four pi, <laughs> two PM, which is two N I I square by X square. which is mu naught by two pi x cube into n i a square. Correct? Yes, sir. Now let's go back to the formula which you derived in the very good. And now if I make x much bigger than a, the b turns out to be mu naught a i square by two pi x cube, right? Yes, sir. which is exactly the formula which we are looking for. The only thing n is missing because I have taken only one term. Yes, sir. Same formula. Yes, sir. Which means so what you derive was correct. <coughs> yes. Sir. So the good thing is that once we have the dipole approximation, the shape really doesn't matter. I can write the formula for any arbitrary shape. 
whose dipole moment is given to you as two one. So any randomly shaped object, <coughs> if you know the dipole moment, then at a point P, the matrix will be <coughs> mu not <coughs> by four pi, two pm by x cube, and the pm will come from any shape. Understood. So yeah. I can bring a triangle, a rectangle, a square, or any random shape of your choice. All right. Yes, sir. Okay. So now we'll talk about the solenoid. So a solenoid is a, a, you can say, arrangement in which a very large number of turns of a wire is wrapped around some hollow space. Now the hollow space can have any shape. It can be cylindrical in shape. It can be like a frustum of a hollow cone. <coughs> it can be rectangular in shape. So there is no condition on the the cross-sectional shape, but it should have the empty space. Oh. Now, although every shape is allowed, but uh, we will restrict our discussion to the cylindrical shape because that will have a very much mathematical uh, formula and uh, that can be derived easily. Okay. So also might is like a large number of terms and uh, the terms, terms of the wire will be closely packed. It means essentially there won't be any gap. So every wire will overlap onto each other. and so on. So it's a large number of uh, turns of a wire which is wrapped. To make it simple, I'll do a cross-sectional view. I can do something like this.
so <coughs> a very large number of current uh, turns of uh, wire is wrapped and the current i is flowing through it okay and uh, you can define something called n which is called the total <coughs> number of turns uh, there are certain assumption which is in place which we need to understand that that the wire will not overlap so there is no overlapping terms there is <coughs> no So there is no overlapping terms and the second is there is no gap between the terms so every diagram that we draw is for the convenience i of course i cannot draw everything <coughs> accurately so you're supposed to remember this that uh, <clears throat> there is no gap between the wires and there is no overlapping turns also. The other thing that we define here is called uh, the processional radius and the length of the entire solenoid. And the last thing that we define is called is small n, which is called number of turns per unit length. Okay. Number of turns per unit length. So Mathematically connect as n upon l. And why we define so to demonstrate the same. Let me cut uh, longitudinally and let me show you the cross sectional view of the solenoid. So what you can see is the half uh, solenoid. Let's see the cross sectional view actually. And uh, <clears throat> because every wire is occupying the the you can see surface, so I can do a wire as a some round object like this. So what you are looking right now is the cross section of the wire this is cross section of wire actually highly zoomed wire of course it will be like very thin but if i draw really thin it will take a lot of time to finish right yes sir. so all are like kind of this is like cutting the uh, solenoid along the cross section, you get right. So, yeah, yeah, you're cutting along the length, yes. Sir. Ah. So, what you're looking at is the, <coughs> the cross sectional view of the wire which you have cut. Okay. Okay, yes, and uh, okay, let me do something like this quickly.
and if i say that uh, the current is entering from let's say this is the current direction so from the top edge the current is going into the plane correct yes Uh, is it possible to draw this? So current is going into the plane and It is coming out of the plane from the bottom edge, right? Yes, sir. So the dot and the cross is representing what? The direction of current act. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, we assume something like this, that uh, if the dimension of every cross-sectional wire, if the diameter of a wire, diameter means the diameter of cross-section, If the diameter of R is D, and if we have n turns, the total length of the solenoid can be expressed as n into D. Yes. And therefore, the inverse of diameter will give you a small n. So knowing the diameter will give you directly small n value. That's why this is famous. So these assumptions are in place for a reason. So inverse of diameter is called D is what the light here D is the diameter of cross section of a wire. not solenoid. So don't get confused that this means from I this means for solenoid. It's only for the <coughs> the wire. So the wire will have the cross section. Okay. Yes. So these are some basic uh, terminology that uh, that we should be aware of, and uh, so it is. Uh, let me put the definition also. So what is the definition? It is an arrangement. In which a very large. number of turns of wire. So it is an arrangement in which a very large number of turns of wire is wrapped around and <coughs> around and Hollow object. So this arrangement is called solenoid. The general purpose solenoid is called infinite solenoid, and the purpose of uh, infinite solenoid is to create a uniform magnetic field in its volume. Okay. So. You can have finite solenoid and you can have infinite solenoid. So, <clears throat> what is the meaning of infinite solenoid? Of course, in reality, nothing can be infinite. It must be some assumption. So, when the length of a solenoid exceeds its radius by very large value, at least 10 times. Minimum is 10 times. 
uh, we can treat this as infinite so not you can think as example the refill of a the refill of a pen the refill is you can see it's a like, thin hole is there in which ink is put yes sir. so the length of the tube and the cross section radius is uh, having the large ratio right yes sir and therefore if i wrap a, a very thin wire around this uh, refill we can say it is infinite okay yes sir. and all you can see clearly that the infinite sonnet will have length of few inches only so it is quite possible that infinite thing can have can be just 1 cm it depends on the ratio so what really matter is the cross section radius and the length relation infinity is just a concept nothing to do with the infinity of mathematical sense okay yes so <clears throat> purpose of sonnet is generally what is the purpose so in general it is used to in general it is used to in the magnetic field of uniform yeah. is to create I mean, uniform, a, yeah, uniform so in general it is used to create uniform magnetic field that is the general purpose <coughs> okay so we'll start with the finite so of course here the purpose of the okay now in case of uh, finite sonnet it will act as a bar man and will create <coughs> magnetic field similar to bar man the field inside the solenoid will be non infinite so if it is infinite it will be non infinite so if it is finite then it is non infinite for infinite it is infinite so we'll start with the in, uh, finite uh, sorry not and then we'll derive the so imagine <coughs> uh we have finite sorry not I'll do only two things. So this cross will represent that uh, the current is going into the plane. and the, the dot will represent so i will just draw one cross and one dot which means from the upper edge the current is entering it. from lower it is coming up okay. so we have something called the axis of solenoid which is common sense 
nothing but the axis of cylinder and uh, we can choose any random point p Sir? Okay, so so let me join the point P. P is a uh, one specified point on the axis, and uh, if you look from the point P on the right and left edge, the angle it will subtend. This is beta, and this is alpha. And we are only supposed to find the magnetic field at point P. Given n is given number of turns per unit length. I is the current through each turn. So everything is given to us, <coughs> current through each turn, <coughs> number of turns per unit length, okay? Yes. And we are supposed to find the magnetic field at the point. If you want, you can assume the radiuses are, which is of course not required. <coughs> and if you wish, you can also assume the length L. So why we are asking this question? Because we know that if I take a, a small piece of solenoid, it will act as a ring and the point P becomes the axis, axial point of the ring, right? Yes, sir. And we know the formula already. So we have to convert that formula into yes, sir. the angular form. So it's like roughly I'll give you the idea. So you can take elementary like this and it will have the angle something like this, g theta theta and all. And you can think about it. Okay. So try this out. Then uh, after five minutes or six, I'll solve. Yeah. Okay.
am getting a bit confused in bringing okay. it to alpha beta times. Okay. So it is uh, similar to what we have done many times. So let me draw it once again. Okay. So the P is the target point, I would say. And uh, we cut element somewhere here, right? So it's, it will have a <coughs> distance X from the point P and the thickness will be DX. That's uh, the regular norm, right? In this small, tiny, small space, you can have multiple turns, right? It will have multiple turns inside. And this is a DX, yeah. correct? So you can draw like this. And how many turns it will have? Let's call it DN. So the number of turns will be a small n DX, right? Yes. <coughs> because a small n represents the number of turn per unit length. So if you multiply with length, we get the exact number of turns okay yes uh, the next step is uh, the location or you can say the angular position of this element you can also express in terms of theta okay so if i call this as a theta and if i choose this as radius r the relation that you can see clearly is the tan theta, right? So X will be R tan theta. And therefore, if you differentiate, you can write, get the, the theta and X relation. <coughs> you can assume this distance as R, because that's easy for you to write, or you can leave it. So the next step is writing the DB due to the ring on its axial position. What is the formula? Mu naught by two N I R square upon X square plus R square power three by two. So this is generally how we write, right? So dn we can write as n dx, <coughs> i is i, r square tan square. And x we can write as r tan theta, so r square will become r cube. And uh, one plus tan square theta is uh, sec square theta, which is sec cube theta. Is this clear? Yes. So mu naught upon two, is n i r square <clears throat> and dx is nothing but the r sec square theta divided by r cube sec cube theta so the all r will cancel out this entire uh, the sec square will cancel out and what you're left with is mu naught n i by 2 <coughs> cos theta d theta right Yes. So that was the only uh, so the DB turns are to be mu naught in I by two sine theta d theta. So the net magnetic field at the point P will be integration of this term. <coughs> and now theta we can vary from minus beta to plus alpha, right? Yes. 
So BP turns out to be mu naught n i by two. And oh, this is positive. My bad. There is yes. Pause. And then <coughs> we can add a sign alpha. So this is the uh, the answer only at the axial position. The next will be <coughs> what if the point uh, resides outside the solenoid? So what will be the axial value? So for any point which is beyond the dimension of solenoid, but on the axis. We know how to derive the relation, right? So it is the same format with one small change. The the limit will change, right? Where it's sorry, I don't understand where it's over like that. Yes, sir. So. <clears throat> So now the beta and alpha both will have the same direction and uh, the way of taking the elementary will be same if you start from you will start from the point p and we will walk some distance on the axis we'll take some elementary we'll do something and then get the answer okay So the dB turns out to be how much? It is again mu naught n i by two. Yes, sir. Cos theta d theta. The only difference is <coughs> integration, which is beta to alpha. Beta to alpha. Yes, sir. And therefore, the answer will be sine alpha minus sine beta. So as that this has been trained. So once we get the answer for solenoid, we can derive multiple formulas. So in fact, the infinite solenoid can be solved in a similar fashion. So for infinite solenoid, that's one. Now, if we have infinite solenoid, so the concept of infinite solenoid means the length is much bigger than the radius. Okay. <laughs> so, in a way, we can say that the entire solenoid is very close to the axis, right?
So the diagram which I have drawn later on, this is the infinite solenoid, technically. So what you can realize, if it is something is really infinite, then the entire volume is close to the axis. Yes, sir. So I can say that the value which we calculated for the axis should be valid for the entire volume itself. Yes, sir. So for infinite solenoid, <clears throat> There are two things. First of all, the answer which you determine or calculate for the axis will be equally valid for the entire volume. And the second is the entire, the, the magnetic field will be parallel to the axis and uniformly distributed. So it's like the lines of force, which you can imagine, <coughs> will be almost parallel to the axis. So as long as we are away from the edge, it will maintain its uh, uniformity. But as you come close to the edge, the field will, will no longer be symmetrical. And rather near the edge, it becomes <coughs> like this. So this is the uh, roughly idea of the infinite solenoid. But the thing is, of course, this kind of diagram you won't get in uh, either textbook or examination. It's difficult uh, maybe to draw, uh, not for printing, but in generally when you see the question, <clears throat> they draw a really big picture and that will not give you the sense of infinity. Okay. Yes. So what you really need to understand is <coughs> what you need to concentrate is the wording. Like if I'm saying it is infinite, assume everything like this. And it really doesn't matter what kind of diagram I'm drawing here. Okay. So If it is infinite solenoid, So once you make it infinite, then alpha and beta will tends to. So for any point P, because the idea is infinite, so the end will appear at very far away. Understood. So for infinite solenoid, am audible? Sir, I will hear me. Yes, sir. Yeah. Am I audible to you? Yes, sir. So for infinite solenoid, alpha and beta tends to 90 degree. Assuming point P away from H. OK. <laughs> So assuming point P away from the edge alpha beta tending to 90 degree and therefore the BP turns out to be how much? And now I will not say BP, I will say only B because it is going to be same for the entire volume. So the B will be equal to how much? Me not Ni by 2 into 
साइन नाइनटी प्लस साइन नाइनटी राइट विच इज सिंपली मी नॉट एन आई so for infinite solenoid magnetic field in the entire volume will be equals to mu not ni now there is a special case which uh, you must understand and re remember and that is at the edge there one of the angles takes to zero and the other to 90 yeah so we can call it for semi infinite yes sir so if i have a semi infinite so the point p is here it is like if it is really infant it will come like this right so now the b at p will be how much The answer will be not n i by two, and now you can see one angle is ninety, but other angle is zero. Yes, sir. Let me write down this sign zero. <coughs> so coming to the edge, the the magnetic field becomes mu not n i by two, and the the reason why the field is decreasing at edge because the field will become curve okay so the lines of force will separate from each other so as we can see that okay near the edge the field lines are like this so once you come near the edge so our edge will be somewhere like this and you can see much before you come to edge the field lines becomes separated from each other understood yes sir so the uniformity of the field will be disturbed <coughs> and the field strength will diminish by half value so if i plot a graph <coughs> if i plot a graph for a solenoid with origin at its center and the right edge at uh, plus l by 2 and the left edge at uh, minus l by 2 so we know that if you are far away from the edge i'll draw something a diagram so the value of magnetic field let's say origin is center of solenoid so what happens that the magnetic field will be almost constant as long as you are away from the edge but when you are almost close to the edge it will suddenly drop its value to half value and it will now further decrease so this is me not n i and this is me not n i by 2 level 
and even beyond the edge the field will diminish at a very greater rate and will vanish very soon right <laughs> so as you move away from the edge the field will decay very rapidly and will become zero okay yes sir okay So this is the for semi infinite and uh, for every type of solenoid you can always find the magnetic field. If it is uh, finite, then we can only find for axis. And if it is infinite, then we can believe that uh, the axis and the rest part of the volume is close to the axis. And uh, there is a very good approximation that the value on the axis which we found will be true for every other point. So we uh, assume that the field will be uniform throughout its volume and the field lines will be parallel to the axis of solenoid. Okay. Yes. All right. Just a Now, solenoid will not only come in terms of wire, we can always create current by, you know, moving the charge. So imagine we have a cylinder. So let's say we have infinite cylinder. Uh, which is uniformly charged. And if the sigma is the surface charge density. R is the radius <clears throat> and L is the length. So everything is given to you along with the assumption that the L is much bigger than R. Now, so far it is simply a cylinder with some charge, surface charge density. The moment we set this into rotation, let's say omega is the rotation. So it is now like a current carrying wire or you can say current carrying loop. 
yes sir. of course you want to be able to see the turns but you can see the total current so you have to correlate that total current idea from solenoid to here to you can write the direct answer for the b so by default we are taking the infinite solenoid scenario so b will be how much that's your question <coughs>
got the answer? Sir, I am doing it. So first of all, you need to find the current. What is the total current? So total current is Q omega by 2 pi, right? Yes, sir. Have we done this part uh, before, like uh, the current due to the uh, rotating object? Sir, no, sir. Okay. No, I think we have done, but let's see. If we have not done, we'll do it again. So there is something called, I think we have done, but uh, <clears throat> in current chapter. Anyway, any moving charge. So if we have a moving charge, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I remember doing it. Yeah. So, yes, sir. so if you do any cross section around the path, it will take exactly one time period to come back, right? Yes, sir. So that uh, the current is defined as the charge upon time period. Inverse of time period is called frequency. And frequency we can also write as omega by 2 pi, or you can say t is 2 by 2 pi by omega. So every rotating charge will create a current. So similarly, here, if you really wish to understand the current, you have to draw a cross sectional view which can encompass the entire charge in one rotation. So if you draw something like this in one rotation, the entire charge will cross through this, right? This cross section. Yes, sir. So, what is the total charge here? So, the first step is finding the net charge. And the net charge will be sigma into area. Yes, sir. What is area? Tell me. Pi r. No. Sir, uh it is the surface of cylinder, no? Yes, sir. So what is the area of cylinder? Curved surface area? Sir, curved surface area is 2 pi r. Yeah. Sir, I said this only in the beginning. You said pi r. No, sir. Okay. So the net charge is sigma into 2 pi r, right? Yes, sir. Very good. And because omega is given to us, so what is the total current through the entire cross section so current we got is <coughs> sigma rl omega right yes and this current will be through this surface right like this Yes. And in case of solenoid, what is the total current? So comparing to solenoid, <coughs> the Ni represents the total current? Yes. And N we can write as small n to L? Yes, sir. So you can clearly see that n into i we can replace by i by l. And therefore, the formula will be b equals to the answer was mu naught ni. And now you can write as mu naught i by l. And by the way, if you look carefully, the i by l is having even a better way of writing. So it is mu naught sigma r omega. Do you understand this? Yes, sir. Very good. So that is how we uh, derive the the B value. Okay. 
So similarly, if I give you a question like this, And this is the line of symmetry that it is like a hollow sphere. Or you can say a spherical shell. So I will write. <coughs> Uniformly charged. Hemispherical shell so if we have hemispherical shell okay And if you turn this with omega, then every elementary ring, you can draw many multiple rings, right? Yes. So every ring will become a current ring loop. Yes. And because it will be loop, you know how to find the magnetic field at the axis of the loop. So the point O becomes the axis of the loop. The question is find the B at O. <coughs> find the B at O. Okay, so now this will be your homework. Okay. So it just like, I mean, like it's a closed uh, hemispherical shell. So how will the magnetic loops look like? So? Like this. You can always do something like this. Okay. Sorry, so the magnetic loops. Yeah, this is like a current thing loop, no? Yes, yeah, sir. Sir, but the magnetic field lines need to be like closed loops yeah so if one of the ends are like closed then how will it look like so mm. okay so now this is the loop so it will create the field lines so it will create the field lines like this of course but the axle will be like this one And it is everywhere. So it will like pass through the hemispherical. Yeah. Shell. For any any circular loop, 
uh, let me show you draw the you take a current current loop like this and uh, <clears throat> you can draw a plane which is perpendicular to the loop okay And if you sprinkle, let's say current swing, if we sprinkle the iron fillings, then this is the exactly center. So if what we'll see the iron fillings will align itself in a, like a, this way. So the heap, there is a heap you will see here. And very close to the wire, the heap will be like this. Okay. And as you go away, the heap will become more and more straight. Now, the moment you go towards the center to the other side, the bending will turn like this. And if you go very close to the wire, the field lines will be definitely like a circular loop. So this is the direction of field lines in a plane, normal to the loop. And then if you look at the center, it is always perpendicular, right? Yes, sir. So for this current thing, wire at this point we have we call it is a cross field, right? If you remember. Yes, and for that matter, at any point on the plane, it is cross. Right? It is trying to go entering and going on the other side, right? Yes, so for the same thing is for this loop, <clears throat> for any axial position, because the O is a point. So for any loop, this axial position will contribute B in this direction, right? Yes, and therefore, we know the formula for the loop. What is the formula for the loop? DB equals to? Now, n will not come. Mu not by 2, i r square. Oh, yes. You can say di r square upon uh, <coughs> this radius. Because that is the radius of the loop. So r is small r square plus x square will become capital R square and so it become R cube. Understood? Yes, sir. And then di you have to replace dq omega by 2 pi. And dq can attach sigma dj. So we have done this in electrostatics. Yes, sir. And the di you can attach 2 pi r. <laughs> sin theta into r d theta if you remember every step like this yes sir and the rest i'm giving to you yeah hey you basically solved the question <laughs> yeah that's true anyways i'll give me uh, many more questions uh, for you to solve there are many yes. questions you can create see because the convection current itself is a source of current so every question that we solve for the DC current can be solved for the convection current. The only thing is we need to find the some similarity. Okay. So something we need to find and understand it. Okay. Okay, sir. All right. So okay, we'll continue the same in the next lecture. We'll start the ampere circuit law. Hopefully. Yes. And uh, yeah, it will not take much. I mean, much time. So I think. Uh, maximum three more three to four lectures and we are done with the magnetism so two week more so by the first week of uh, august i mean first week of september uh, we will be done with the magnetism and then uh, we can start the electromagnetic induction and then of course modern physics will be there and what i want to i mean you to do is like you start reading the other topics uh, in class 11th topic, okay. 
and uh, then after once you are done with the emi and modern physics you can start doing the problem practice so till the till the je means we will be doing the problem practice we will be solving uh, last uh, 5 to 10 year problem of je means thoroughly so every week we have to only problem solving and that will give you the enough practice to crack the exam with ease okay so yes, from <coughs> pardon optics chapter sir optics i will also upload so you can watch anyway i will try to teach optics uh, uh, i will try to teach optics in a way like in a short i'll finish it okay so for detail you can watch but uh, i'll give you the idea that how to solve every question so optics is not difficult don't worry okay sir so i will teach you optics and wave optics both separate yes don't sir only you finish the 11th part because that is only application there is nothing like concept so whatever we have studied till uh, uh, rotational dynamics the same we are going to use okay yeah. and uh, because why you need to do is because the jan uh, session examination by the jan term you should be ready and uh, any topic which is left we can complete in between so by the next exemption term which will be mostly in april you will be ready with every topic completely so for jan term examination like we are attempting both times sir yeah yeah we are going we, we are we can attempt every exam every session which they create so minimum you will get two two terms okay sir sir that means like for the covid times and on like the students were able to attend it like four times yeah yeah now it's i think two times yes sir but two will be there it may go to three but two is minimum okay sir okay all right so yes, see you in the next lecture on thursday right yes sir okay. good night sir good thank night. you sir